Today we got some actual history about an early Arizona settler named Pete Kitchen, who lived south of Tucson in dangerous Apache territory from the 1850s through the 1880s. We'll be reading first from this book, Arizona Characters by Frank C. Lockwood. This book was published all the way back in 1928. Then we'll read from this article, Pete Kitchen, American Pioneer, by Elizabeth R. Snoke. This was published in 1979 in the Journal of the Southwest. This article provides some additional details about Pete Kitchen's battles with the Apaches, including a legend about something Pete Kitchen did to help the son of Apache leader Cochise. This resulted in the Apaches finally sparing the Kitchen Ranch from further attacks. Pete Kitchen, Arizona Pioneer, Rifleman, and Ranchman Pete Kitchen was the connecting link between savagery and civilization in Arizona. He was a rough charcoal sketch of a civilized man. He came to Arizona in 1854 and farmed rich, broad acres on Potrero Creek, near its junction with the Santa Cruz. During the bloodiest days of Indian warfare, his name was a household word among the white settlers. And to the wild Apache, he was more terrible than an army with banners. His hacienda, situated on the summit of a rocky hillock, overlooking the valley in every direction, was as much a fort as a ranch house. On their raids through the valley, the Apaches passed by it both coming and going. Kitchen was almost the last settler to hang on after the withdrawal of troops in 1861. His ranch was the safest point between Tucson and Magdalena in Sonora, and during the darkest days of Apache warfare, miners, settlers, and travelers made it a sort of rallying point. Thomas Casanega, who lived on a nearby ranch in the early days, and who married a niece of Pete Kitchen, told me that there were more men killed between Potrero and Magdalena than in all the rest of the Apache territory. He said that so many men lost their lives between these two points that if their bodies laid side by side, like railroad ties, they would make a track from Nogales to Potrero. The flat roof of Kitchen's adobe ranch house was surrounded by a parapet three or four feet high, and a sentinel was constantly posted here to sound the alarm in case of an attack. There was also always an armed sentinel posted in the Cienega with the stock. The Indians would try to approach by stealth through the canyon that came in from the east opposite the hacienda. In case of a sudden attack, the guard would discharge his gun as a signal to the Indian and Mexican workmen in the fields below. The men would instantly run for the house, while Pete and his wife, Doña Rosa, would gather up the guns from the corners and wall racks and lay them out for ready use. By being thus constantly on the alert, they were always able to stand off the Indians and prevent them from getting up the hill. Doña Rosa became so expert that in the case of necessity she was able to carry on the business alone, and Pete declared that without her he could have never held on. When the alarm was sounded she would tie her skirts around her to make them look like trousers, would seize her gun, and with the help of the Apata Indians who were employed to fight as well as to farm, she would give the Apaches a reception as hot as her Mexican dishes. Pete Kitchen was the only settler whom the Apaches could not dislodge. They made raid after raid, and shot his pigs so full of arrows that they looked like walking pincushions. They killed or drove out his bravest neighbors, they killed his herder, and they slaughtered his stepson, but Pete Kitchen fought on undaunted. His name struck terror to every Apache heart, and at last, finding that he was too tough a nut to crack, they passed him by. Many stories have been told of Pete Kitchen's alertness, marksmanship, and cool courage. He was never caught napping. He was as ready with his gun as he was sure of his mark. The Indians were never able to ambush him. Grim experience had taught him to be careful when there was a patchy sign, and to be still more careful when there was no sign. He never traveled the same road twice. He was endowed with a sort of sixth sense that told him when Apaches were lurking for him. More than once he saved his life by his almost uncanny wariness.
There was one memorable night when the old rifleman had an uneasy feeling that all was not as it should be. So, taking his Mexican wife, Doña Rosa, to the dugout on the edge of the rocky hill just below the ranch house, he set himself to keep sharp watch. From the door sill there was a drop of some two feet to the floor. Crouching inside with his weapon on the door sill, he watched the slope below them for hours. The sky was somewhat overcast. Once in the dim light, he thought he detected a slight movement below him. The cloud that had partly obscured the sky had passed, and by the increased light he thought the object on which he had kept his eye seemed closer than before. He fired, and there was a terrible yell in reply. He watched on through the night, but in the morning found no dead Indian. He thought, though, that he saw some indication that a dead body had been dragged away, and moving down into a field where there were slight traces of the ground having been disturbed, he took the rod from the end gate of his wagon, and probing deeply into the soft earth found the body of a dead Indian. The tragedy that struck home deepest in the Kitchen family was the murder of an adopted son, about twelve years of age, Crandall by name. One day the boy went with the Mexican laborers to work in the field below the house to the south. He grew drowsy after a while and fell asleep in the hay. A band of Apaches rushed on the Mexicans and began firing. Pete heard one shot and then another and another. When the fight began, the Mexicans ran for the house, forgetting all about the boy. He woke up just as the Indians were upon him, and the Indians shot him through the body while he was making the sign of the cross. Pete had a number of Opata Indians at work in the field to the west of the house. When the alarm was given, they came in at once. By the time they got in, the old man had the rifle stacked on the ground, ready for their use. At this instant, an Apache lookout, posted behind a boulder 600 yards to the east on the opposite ridge, rose up and waved a signal to the Apaches in the field to hurry up, as the Opatas were coming. And the fight was on. Pete drew down on this Indian in the brief moment that he exposed himself and killed him at that great distance. He said he drew a bead about six inches above the Apache's head. The bullet pierced his body. After the fight was over, Kitchen went with some of his men and buried the Indian where he fell. Kitchen was a very generous and companionable man, but there was a certain grim jocularity in his dealings with his enemies. He was once riding along the road through greasewood, cactus, and mesquites with his double-barreled shotgun thrown across his saddle bow when he thought he saw a slight stirring in the bushes in front of him a little way to the right. Swinging his gun very quietly into position for use, he rode steadily toward the bush. Just before he reached it, a man leaped suddenly into view with his revolver drawn and said, "'Throw up your hands!' Instantly, with both barrels of his gun cocked, Pete covered the fellow and said, Throw up your hands! The man dropped his weapon to the ground, threw up his hands, and yelled, Don't shoot, Pete! I wasn't going to kill you! I was only going to rob you! Just what I was going to do to you, said Pete. Shell out! The fellow did so, but the amount produced was only 35 cents. Pete threw him two bits and said, Now clear out! and never let me catch you around here again. Some bandits from Sonora once stole two or three of Kitchen's favorite horses. He took up their trail while it was still hot, followed them across the line, and pursuing them day and night for about three days, at last came up with them. He killed one, I believe, one fled, and he captured the third and recovered the horses. As soon as he recrossed the Arizona line and could safely do so, he made camp so that he could get some sleep, being almost dead for want of it. The prisoner, tied hand and foot, and with a rope around his neck, was left on horseback under the limb of a tree, to which the other end of the rope was attached. In telling this story, Pete was wont to punch his listener in the ribs and say with a chuckle, You know, while I was asleep, that damned horse walked off and left that fellow hanging there. Pete Kitchen had his own little boot hill. It was just in front of the ranch house where the railroad track is now. Here the outlaws and desperados whom he shot and killed were buried. He hung two bandits and buried them here. 
Dona Rosa, being a good Catholic, burned candles on the graves of these bad men, who had fought their fight, had finished their course, and with their boots on had been sent to their reward by the strong right arm of her husband. About 1880, John MacArthur, the youngest scion of the famous MacArthur family, was rendezvousing at Pete Kitchen's ranch and enjoying large, luscious slices of the wild southwest. He was perhaps causing his father and the older brother some anxiety at the time. The MacArthurs were the builders of the Suez Canal and the Chicago Drainage Canal, and were well known for other very large contracts that they had successfully put through. John was trying to get his brothers to buy kitchen share in the Pajarita Mining Company, and Archibald, James, and William had come out to look over the property, and incidentally to make sure that their youthful brother did not get into any mischief. They were being entertained royally by Pete. He took them on hunting trips, fed them on wild turkey and choice ham and bacon, and took them on expeditions into the mountains. They were like boys out of school in their enjoyment of this outing. John was supposed to have taken on some of Pete Kitchen's skill with a gun, and one day in the yard at the ranch, while each one was boasting and showing off his skill with firearms, one of the brothers put a little stone on a watermelon. The Tenderfoot brothers from Chicago challenged Arizona John to shoot it off. There was much swaggering and boasting, but the stone remained untouched. At last, John's turn came, and with great pose and a flourish of his thirty-two, he said, I'll show you how to shoot. Pete had been standing in the doorway of the ranch house all this time, some distance behind, watching them. Just as the older brother waved his gun like a flash, Pete reached behind the door and seized his rifle. Bang! The stone was shattered, and the quick-witted brother said, There, that's the way to do it. None of them knew what had happened until Rockfellow, who had been living at the ranch for some time, told the Chicago brothers about Pete's trick. It was several days later before they made known to John just what had taken place. Kitchen's hacienda was like a feudal estate. His immediate family consisted of ten members, made up mostly of nieces of his Mexican wife. He was very kind and generous to these girls, caring for them and educating them as if they were his own children. He used to take delight on coming home from Tucson, where he went at long intervals to market his produce and distributing candy, toys, and various other gimmicks to the children of the establishment. He was hospitable and kept open house. All travelers were welcome, and his friends could not come too often nor stay too long. We get a close-up view of life on the kitchen ranch from John G. Bork in his excellent book, On the Border with Crook. The traveler was made to feel perfectly at ease. If food were not ready on the fire, some of the women set about preparation of the savory, spicy stews for which the Mexicans are deservedly famous, and others kneaded the dough and patted into shape the paper-like tortillas with which to eat the juicy frijoles or dip up the tempting chile colorado. There were women carding, spinning, sewing, doing the thousand and one duties of domestic life in a great ranch that had its own blacksmith, saddler, and wagon maker, and all other officials needed to keep the machinery running smoothly. In addition to the band of Opata Indians who were employed to work and fight, there were a good many Mexican workmen on the estate, some of them with families. Pete Kitchen had his own commissariat, and issued all necessary supplies to his own people, and in case of need, to travelers. Kitchen's ranch took in about a thousand acres of rich bottomland, and he raised large crops of grain, potatoes, cabbages, and an abundance of fruit and melons. He had a great many cattle, and his particular delight was a drove of several hundred fine hogs. He prepared large quantities of ham and bacon of a delicious quality. This was his specialty. Before the advent of the railroad, the Tucson stores used to display signs, Pete Kitchen's Hams. The settlements all the way from Nogales to Silver City, New Mexico, were supplied with lard, bacon, and ham from the Kitchen Ranch. A personal item in the Tucson Citizen of June 15, 1872, gives an idea of the extent of Pete Kitchen's prosperity at that time. He reported that his crops were all good, 
that he had in 20 acres of potatoes, that during the year he had cured 14,000 pounds of choice bacon and hams, and had marketed 5,000 pounds of lard. These products brought him, on the average, 35 cents a pound. He sold large quantities of potatoes in the Tucson market, as well as other produce of various kinds, so his cash income for the year must have been in the neighborhood of $10,000. When the railroad came into Arizona, the old ranchman found competition so strong that he could not make money as of old, so he sold his ranch for a good round figure and moved to Tucson. Here he spent the remainder of his days and all of his money. He was not adapted to the soft, seductive ways of civilization in the old Pueblo. He was a free spender, generous and careless. He was not one to refuse aid to a friend in need. If a theatrical beauty pleased him, he would shower the stage with silver dollars. He had too much leisure, was a good mixer, and an exceedingly good fellow. And about the only way to display these qualities was at the bar and the gaming table. He was in his glory at the Fiesta of St. Augustine, which was elaborately celebrated in Tucson in the early days. Few there were who did not take part in the revelry and gaming, and as for Pete Kitchen, he patronized to the limit with reckless hilarity the roulette wheel and the faro table. On one occasion, after Kitchen moved to Tucson, he was taken very sick. His spleen seemed to be out of order. Word was sent to Rockfellow at Cochise Stronghold to come over and help nurse the old man. When Rockfellow arrived, matters looked serious, and there was a great hubbub. Dr. Handy and a nurse were in attendance, and Fred Mayish, Pete's chief crony and proprietor of the Palace Saloon, was tramping about in the room in great excitement. Mayish himself was an outstanding figure in the old Tucson days. He was a man of enormous throat, chest, and girth. He was noted for his unique linguistic blunders, and when he spoke, he bellowed like a bull of Bashan. Two cowboy friends of Pete's, alarmed by the reports that they had heard, came ducking and tiptoeing in while Rockfellow was there, awkwardly fingering their sombreros. What seems to be the matter with Pete, one of them asked. Oh, Doc says his screen's out of whack, Mayish roared in reply. Pete was not too sick to smile at this Partington shaft. Pete Kitchen's word and note were good anywhere. One of his old associates, Joe Wise, tells that Pete came to him on the streets of Tucson one day and asked, Joe, can you lend me $200? I'm sorry, Pete, but I'm broke and want to borrow some money myself. Well then, said Pete, let's go to the bank together, borrow $300, sign the note jointly, and divide the money between us. All right, his friend replied. If we haven't the cash when the note comes due, I've got a few head of cattle in the canyons over there on my ranch that we can round up and sell. Will you be out there and help me find them and bring them in if we can't meet the note? I'll sure be there, was the reply. When the note fell due, neither of them had any money. The rancher had not seen Pete for a long time, as his ranch was about 50 miles distant from Tucson, in the region of Calabasas. But on the appointed day, as he was looking out for his steers far off on the mesa, he saw the figure of a solitary horseman riding in his direction. It proved to be Pete. He had spent the whole night on the road in order to be there on time. The cattle were rounded up and driven to market, and the note was paid the day it was due. Kitchen still bought and sold cattle after he had disposed of his ranch. On one occasion, he bought 700 head of Mexican cattle, and the vaqueros drove them from Sonora to Tucson to deliver them. The Mexican herders were very ignorant, and were afraid to take either checks or greenbacks in payments. They refused to take anything but gold coin. There was not enough gold in town to pay them. So, after he had discharged at them a volley of the most effective and picturesque oaths at his command, Pete sent to Los Angeles for the gold. Meanwhile, the Mexican cowboys waited and enjoyed the sights of the metropolis. When the gold came, they were so ignorant that they could not count it. Here, you damned fools, I'll count it for you, said Pete. When it was all counted, the chief herder put it into a bag, which he carried around with him everywhere on his shoulder. 
The fascinating feast of St. Augustine was in full blast by this time, and the Mexicans entered wholeheartedly into the festivities. But they found the bag of gold a very serious impediment. Seeing the predicament the fellow was in, Pete came to him and said, Here, give it to me, you damned fool. I'll give it to Doña Rosa, and she'll take care of it. He took it to his house and threw it under the bed, and the Mexican came and got it when he was ready to go home. Leading citizens of Arizona, now grown gray, tell with feeling of kind treatment at the hands of Pete Kitchen when they first came to the territory as raw young fellows seeking their fortunes. Jeff Milton was one such a youth, and he tells this story. Pete Kitchen was a good friend, but a bitter enemy. One day in the Palace Saloon, of which Fred Mayish was a proprietor, Pete Kitchen was playing cards with some of his friends when a green young fellow from California, who had been looking on, asked if he could come into the game. They didn't want him in, but he insisted, so they let him take a hand. I was just looking on. The stranger was a poor sport, and as he was losing, he kicked up a rumpus. Finally, he raised up from his seat and began to pull a gun on Pete, who was unarmed. I just throwed my gun across the table and covered him and said, Hold on, wait a minute, you can't chew up that little old fellow. Pete sort of pushed back his chair, and as he started for the door, said to the fellow, I'll be back in a few minutes and talk it over with you. I tried to quiet the fellow, but kept my gun on him. He was only a coward, and he whimpered. What are you going to do to me? What do you want to hurt me for? I'm not going to hurt you, but do you know who that is you're trying to kill? That's Pete Kitchen, and you stand no more show than a baby. You better drag. Old Fred Mayish was very much excited by this time, and he threw up his hands and shouted, Yes, get out quick, get out. Get out! I don't want any bloodshed here! Do you want to ruin me? By the time Pete had returned with his gun, the young fellow had pulled his freight, and we never saw him again. I was called out of town after this, and when I got back, Hamilton, who took care of my office while I was away, said to me, There's a shotgun Pete Kitchen left here. He says it belongs to you. No, that isn't mine. Well, he says it is. The next time I saw Pete, I said, How about that gun of yours you left in my office? Pete shrugged his shoulders and said, It's yours. And that is all that was ever said about it. Pete Kitchen was about 5 feet 9 or 10 inches in height. He was spare, erect, and physically fit even when he was verging toward old age. His eyes were grayish blue, and he was of a florid complexion. He was quiet and inoffensive in manner, quite the opposite of the typical movie hero of today. He usually wore a broad-brimmed sombrero, and instead of an overcoat, a Mexican serape. His friends did not enjoy going on a camping expedition with him, for he made too little provision for food and the ordinary camp comforts. He was hardy and more or less indifferent to hunger and cold himself. So on cattle drives and hunting or scouting expeditions, his comrades sometimes found themselves almost freezing and starving. When he failed to provide for his own comfort, he would sometimes on a cold night crawl under Rockfellow's blanket with him before morning. When he was an old man, he used to come over to the stronghold to visit Rockfellow sometimes. One cold evening, he started to walk to the stronghold from Cochise Station. He had only a serape to keep him warm, and he got so tired and cold by the time he had gone halfway that he stopped and built a campfire to warm himself. He got to Rockfellow's just as the family were at breakfast. The spot where he camped was always called Camp Kitchen after that. When Mr. Rockfellow was in the neighborhood of Kitchen's Ranch one day long after the old man was dead and forgotten, so far as the younger generation was concerned, he met an old Mexican, and when he told him who he was and mentioned the fact that he had once lived for a while on Pete Kitchen's Ranch, the Mexican said with a pleased flash of recollection, Oh, Don Pedro, muy valiente, muy bueno con rifle. Pete Kitchen was a man of no ordinary caliber. Apart from his force, resolution, and general likableness, he was a man of mark and originality. The MacArthur's, great men as they were, with a wide knowledge of men and of big business, spoke of him as a man of power and character. 
They thought that he was one of the ablest men they had ever met, and said that he would have made himself felt in Wall Street or anywhere else that his lot might have been cast. He was the beau ideal of the border men of his day, brave, friendly, honest, and magnanimous, but also profane, a regular drinker, and a diligent and delighted knight of the green table. These were the virtues and these the frailties of his time. So his money melted away, and at the end he had little in store except an unblemished reputation for honesty, a host of generous friends and admirers, and a pioneer record of hard and daring deeds well done. So that's the end of the chapter about Pete Kitchen from the book Arizona Characters. I will now read some additional details about Pete Kitchen's life, particularly his battles with the Apaches in the 1860s and 1870s, from this article, Pete Kitchen, Arizona Pioneer, by Elizabeth R. Snoke. In the 1860 census, Kitchen classified himself as a farmer and valued his property, cattle, at $3,000. The next year, 1861, Kitchen's world fell apart. Travel and business activity along the Upper Santa Cruz attracted Apaches, who mounted large-scale raids into the valley for livestock, particularly horses and mules. Drovers, freighters, stagecoaches, and small ranches and camps all became targets. In October of 1860, a hostile band hit the John Ward Ranch on the Sonoita, not far from Fort Buchanan, and kidnapped Ward's adopted son. In late January of 1861, following an attack on a stagecoach, Lt. George N. Bascom rode to Apache Pass, treated with the Chiricahua chief Cochise, and in a fit of haste, hanged six Indian prisoners. In the spring, a group of Mexicans tracking an Apache group driving 100 stolen horses enlisted help at the Kanawha Ranch and ambushed the marauders in Turkey Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains. These incidents incited the Indians to bolder acts. In June, some 600 warriors swept down the Santa Cruz, burning property including the Kanawha Inn and murdering people on the roads. When the marauders raced down the valley, Kitchen was on his way home after delivering a consignment of cattle to Fort Buchanan, some 50 miles away. Upon his return, he found his buildings burned, all but one of his vaqueros killed, and 440 head of cattle and horses missing. Not a man to be trifled with, Pete collected a group of Papagos at San Javier Mission, buried the dead, and the next morning set out in pursuit of the raiders. Following tracks that led southeast through the Patagonia Mountains and then on east toward Janos, Chihuahua, Kitchen and the Papagos trailed the Apaches for some 70 miles before giving up and doubling back through the Santa Ritas to the Kanoa. He never recovered his stolen livestock valued at $6,900. Kitchen's arrangement with William Grant ended in July of 1861 when the army evacuated its forts in the southwest. Civil war had erupted in the east, and troops were needed to protect the Rio Grande settlements against Confederate attack from Texas. With the army's departure, local ranches and mining camps became easy prey to Apache raiders. Kitchen, therefore, left the Kanoa for the safety of Tucson. When John C. Capron, a freighter who had operated a ranch and store at the Pima Villages, passed through town later that summer, Pete joined him on a trip into Sonora. Not until well after the war had ended did he again look north to the Santa Cruz. Kitchen probably returned to Arizona sometime in 1868. Arizona had become a separate territory from New Mexico on February 14, 1863, and there was hope that the military could contain the Apaches. In 1866, the garrison at Fort Mason had been moved 16 miles northeast of Calabasas to a temporary camp named Camp Cameron. In March of 1867, the soldiers were relocated at Fort Crittenden, just east of Old Fort Buchanan. Many of the families that had settled near Mason to find work and furnish foodstuffs soon left. A post office which had opened at Calabasas in 1866 was closed in 1868, 
Although the population in the area had dwindled, Kitchen asserted squatters' rights to a promontory near the headwaters of Potrero Creek, about halfway between Calabasas and the international border. He was now in his late forties and ready to settle down. The land that Kitchen selected had been recently abandoned. The census taker in the spring of 1867 reported 20 persons in the Potrero district. Included were two large households, the J.H. Bush family, nine members, and the John Ward family, eight members. About 20 people lived a few miles north at Calabasas. Kitchen's location was ideal. The promontory overlooking the west bank of the creek Pinch the stream, forcing it to flow around on three sides. Cienega's swampy areas extended north and south. Here Kitchen could put in crops and turn cattle loose on the hardy grama grass covering the neighboring hills. To operate the farm, he brought along some of his wife's family and a small group of Indians. The party included Rose's brother, Francisco Verdugo, and a brother-in-law, Manuel Ronquillo, and his family. Verdugo supervised the work of the Indians, while Ronquillo directed the farming operations. Operating a farm in Indian country required iron determination. Apache bands from Mexico regularly raided along the Santa Cruz in the late 1860s, and many settlers were driven out. Despite repeated livestock losses, Kitchen fought off the marauders and remained. As friends disappeared, the Potrero became the only safe haven on the road from Tucson to Sonora. With grim humor, Pete joked that travelers going south went from Tucson to Bach to Makakori to Hell. During the night of January 18, 1869, Apaches ran off 50 head of horses from a community corral in a nearby canyon. Kitchen, who owned 17 of the stolen horses, gathered several employees and set out in hot pursuit. After following the Indians into Sonora, then east towards Llanos Hot Springs, the pursuers turned back. Pete later learned that a Tucson merchant, Leopoldo Carrillo, had purchased one of his horses from an Apache during treaty negotiations at the San Carlos Reservation. He reclaimed the animal from Carrillo for $30. Shortly after noon on February 5, 1869, only 18 days after the January raid, a Mexican sheep herder raced to the house and reported that 15 Apaches had driven off the flock he was guarding. Collecting some men, Kitchen gave chase and came upon the Indians slaughtering the sheep. As the raiders scattered, Pete taunted them at the top of his voice to come and accept his horse, too. The Indians declined the invitation. Counting 240 sheep killed, Kitchen's men drove the remnants of the flock home. At the Potrero, they learned that Abram Scott, a neighbor, had not returned from a deer hunt. Riding out the following morning to look for Scott, Pete found his friend murdered in a small canyon some six miles from the ranch. The raids continued. Apaches raced down Potrero Creek again on June 8, 1870, killing an employee and running off four yoke of oxen. A month later, on July 10th, a man named Smith, traveling from San Diego to Sonora, and Jesus Indigo, a Mexican, were murdered in separate incidents on Potrero land. Newspaper accounts of the murders complained of army inactivity, noting that troops seldom scouted in the area of the murders. When the family traveled to and from Tucson, Pete took every precaution. It was a long trip, taking several days by wagon. The men would pile sacks of grain along the sides and back of the wagon bed to provide protection against Indian arrows and bullets, and the family would travel sitting on the floor of the conveyance. To reduce the danger of attack, they usually moved at night. On one trip, the family stopped at a prospector's dugout in the San Cayetano Mountains, but quickly hurried on when fresh Indian signs were seen nearby. Kitchen occasionally accompanied army parties scouting in this area. On the evening of April 30, 1871, Lieutenant Howard Cushing and 17 soldiers of Troop F, 3rd Cavalry, rode into the ranch from Fort Lowell. 
carrying orders to reconnoiter the Santa Cruz and Sonoita Valleys. Kitchen welcomed them and offered his services as a guide. At 5 o'clock the next morning, Cushing headed into the mountains east of the Santa Cruz. When the party failed to sight any Indians, Pete left the detachment and at 3 that afternoon started home. Kitchen had ridden only an hour when he spotted a group of 30 or more mounted Apaches cautiously trailing Cushing. Believing he could not safely ride back to warn the lieutenant, and knowing he would soon be seen, Kitchen devised a ruse. Taking out a block of California matches, he leaned over, tore off one match at a time, scratched it on the bottom of his stirrup, and dropped it into the dry desert grass as his horse walked along. He hoped the fire would conceal his presence and also serve as a warning to Cushing. Although the blaze enabled Pete to escape, Cushing and his men were not so fortunate. Believing that Apaches had set the grass fire as a warning to their compatriots in the mountains, the troopers rode boldly on. Four days later, on May 5th, Cushing led his men into an ambush in which he and two others were killed. On June 8, 1871, tragedy struck the ranch. Some 200 yards from the house, Apaches killed an 11-year-old boy whom the Tucson citizen incorrectly identified as Kitchen's son. Actually, Kitchen had sent a lad, probably Fernando Campo, to nearby Calabasas to pick up a silver-mounted saddle and bridle. On the return trip, 40 or 50 Apaches fired on the boy as he approached the ranch. Hearing the shots, Kitchen quickly saddled a horse and galloped toward the scene. What he found was pitiful. The Apaches had caught the boy, killed him, and pitched the body into a nearby cactus growth. Then, taking the saddle, bridle, and a pair of spurs, they had butchered the horse on the spot. The presence of several Mexicans in the vicinity had not prevented the attack. As the Apaches had calculated, the Mexicans had fled upon hearing the shots. Depredations on the Kitchen Ranch continued. In early July of 1872, an Apache band prowled down the creek and drove off nine yoke of work oxen. The herders sped to the ranch house to tell Pete, who quickly collected some men and set out after the raiders. Although the pursuers could see the Apaches in the distance, the chase proved futile. A day or so later, a Senor Ariego of Sonora rode into Fort Crittenden with news that he had crossed the trail of a herd of cattle being driven by the Indians. Second Lieutenant William P. Hall and Company F of the 5th Cavalry overtook the herd in the Whetstone Mountains at about four in the afternoon of July 13th. After a pitched battle with the Apaches, Hall returned to the fort. He reported that several oxen found slaughtered along the trail bore the Kitchen brand. Kitchen's employees were as alert as their employer to danger. One day Pete's top hand, a black man named Henry, was riding alone in a ravine near the Portrero, when suddenly a lariat dropped down over his shoulders from above. Henry reacted quickly, grabbing the rope above the slipknot before it tightened. He spurred his horse forward, yanked strongly, and jerked down a surprised Indian. Whirling his horse, Henry grabbed the brave's hair and slit his throat before the Apache could react. He then returned to his work. A semi-legendary incident supposedly occurred on the ranch in August of 1873. True or not, the tale illustrates the depth of Kitchen's concern for the welfare of every human being regardless of race. According to the story, a young Apache named Cheese had been sent out alone to test his training. When his horse went lame near the Potrero, he was seized by six Mexicans. Kitchen and Francisco Verdugo were in the vicinity, heard a wailing chant, and rode to investigate. They found the Mexicans torturing their captive, who was singing his death song. Ordering the Mexicans to move on, Pete freed the badly injured boy and took him to the Potrero, where Rosa and the other women cared for him. When the Apache was able to talk, his benefactors discovered that he was the son of Cochise, whose warriors frequently had visited the valley stealing and killing. When the young Indian was well enough to travel, Pete gave him a horse and with a small party accompanied the boy east to the Sulphur Springs Valley, where they hoped to find Cochise. Informed of what had occurred, Cochise agreed to meet Kitchen. 
the Chiricahua chief swore that he and his braves would not again attack the Potrero. To seal the agreement, he gave Kitchen a signal horn, on which Pete inscribed the date, September of 1873, place and the name of participants in the meeting. The boy's mother sent a pair of beautifully beaded Apache boots for Doña Rosa, and a similarly decorated quiver for Pete. During his lifetime, Cochise's band never again attacked the Kitchen Ranch. Kitchen was in and out of Tucson every few months. He made a trip to the San Carlos Agency on contracting business in the autumn of 1875, talked with agent John P. Clum about his operations, then rode back to Tucson. In describing the trip to friends, Pete complained mightily about the absence of a whiskey shop on the reservation. You know when a man is accustomed to sip of the genial stuff at times, it's hard to be wholly deprived of it even for a few days. The last Apache raid on the Potrero occurred in March of 1877, when a large war party from the San Pedro circled past Fort Crittenden and headed up the Santa Cruz. On the 17th, the Indians attacked the Thomas Hughes party. Hughes alone survived. The raiders then raced up the valley, striking at all the ranches, including the Potrero, for horses, mules, and cattle. Hughes, meanwhile, contacted the commander at newly established Fort Huachuca. The commander dispatched troops to intercept the marauders. The soldiers, however, failed to overtake the Indians as they fled north toward the Santa Rita Mountains, driving a herd of cattle, horses, and mules. Kitchen also gave pursuit, but he too was unable to catch the Apaches or recover his stock. Kitchen occasionally had to contend with violence on the ranch. When two American cowboys rode in one day in the late 1870s, Pete invited them to stay and eat. After the meal, a ranch hand produced an accordion, and a dance began. Adam Monroe, one of the visitors, danced with a young wife of one of Kitchen's Mexican employees. Dancing soon became flirtation, and then momentary infatuation. When the jealous husband intervened with knife in hand, Monroe precipitously shot and killed the man, and then fled through an open window. Pete led a party in pursuit and captured the cowboy two days later. Tried at Tucson, Monroe was sentenced to life imprisonment in the territorial prison at Yuma. Eventually, however, he escaped and fled to Mexico, where he remained for eight years. One day in Tombstone, Kitchen by chance spotted the escapee and reported him to the authorities. Monroe was promptly arrested and returned to prison. In January of 1879, Kitchen learned that a band of Mexican outlaws was robbing travelers along the Santa Cruz. Entering a store at Calabasas Ranch, the bandits took money and goods and forced Mescal down the throat of the store owner until he collapsed unconscious. Pete dispatched a rider to Magdalena, Sonora, to ask the local police to ride to a bluff at the point where the Santa Cruz River crossed the international border. Kitchen, meanwhile, organized a party of neighbors to hunt for the bandits. Like beaters driving a tiger toward the hunter, he and his friends circled out to the sides of the valley, then headed south driving the outlaws toward the border. When the renegades crossed the line, the Mexican police pounced on them and executed them on the spot. Arizona historians have made Pete Kitchen a frontier folk hero. He has been called the Daniel Boone of Arizona and a true blue pioneer. The Tucson citizen perhaps best summarized Kitchen's role by saying that he was one of the most remarkable men that had ever faced the frontier dangers of the far southwest. What these dangers were, few people, not actual participants in them, can conceive or appreciate. But they were with him, waking and sleeping. Safety for him and his depended almost wholly on his tremendous courage. He could truly say with Macbeth, I dare do all that may become a man, who dares do more is none. So those were some additional details about Pete Kitchen's life from this article from the Journal of the Southwest, published in 1979. One thing you may have noticed is that in Arizona characters, the author said that the Apaches were never able to dislodge Pete Kitchen from his ranch. This was true from 1868 until he moved to Tucson around 1883, but Pete Kitchen was driven from his first home near Potrero Creek in 1863. 
and his first ranch was burned down by Apaches. If you haven't seen my video about another Arizona character, Charles Poston, then you can watch that for more about the Apache raids that occurred after the U.S. Army's departure from the area during the Civil War in 1861. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about people whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in, and because we cover history that is unworthy of history channels on TV, which don't show actual history anymore. Stay tuned to this channel for more stories about Arizona characters and other actual history. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.